So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back. Um, I hope that you uh, made use of the, the poster session and took a look at the videos in the break as well. Um, we've had a great morning so far, so I, and I, I suspect it's going to continue that well that, that way as well. Um, let me welcome uh, Jenny Saban to the screen. So you've turned on your camera already, so I don't need to ask you to do that. Um, but I do need to do a bit of an introduction. So um, Jenny was pretty much top of our list of people that we wanted to invite uh, to the um, this event today and particularly for this theme session. So um, to give you your full title, Jenny, you're going to have to correct me if I get any of this wrong, that you are the Arthur L. and Isabel B. Weisenberger Professor in Architecture, Cornell University, uh, Principal of Jenny Sabin Studio and uh, the Director of the Sabin Lab. Um, at Cornell University as well. So um, I'm going to let you let your work and your thoughts speak for themselves, Jenny, but just to say that um, we're, I guess there are a couple of reasons why, why I invited you. I mean, my connection to you goes back to, I think, Acadia 2016, um, where you might have been one of only about three people that attended my my, my presentation in the afternoon on Thinking Soils, which we've been talking about this morning. And possibly of those three people, you might have been the only person to understand it as well, which was which was um, um, actually rather satisfying in the end. Um, I guess for, from our perspective, um, one of your most important contributions was the book that you, you co-authored with Peter Lloyd-Jones, and I actually have it here. This is a very, oh, I get... If I do it in front of me, we can see it. So this is still available if people want to buy it. We've been doing a lot of book promotion today. Um, this is kind of a canonical text for us, which is why this version has been so well thumbed and there's notes and things in it all over the place. Um, it was a hugely inspiration when I was starting out in, in this field, bringing design research with biology, but in ways that I think are more interesting than sort of biology, architectural design copying from biology, but understanding the deep principles of biological systems and complexity and turning those into new ways of thinking about design, not only in architecture for the built environment, but also ways of thinking about biology itself. And, and it was that merging of the fields that I think is, um, is, is very rare, if not actually unique in, in our field so far. So we were really excited to, to bring you here today. Um, I can invite you now to share your screen. Great, thank you so much. And then we'll see if this works. This is always slightly nerve wracking at this point. And just to reiterate while we're doing that, that we're live on YouTube, um, as always, please drop your questions for Jenny into the YouTube chat and we will be hosting them. And I'll be together with Josh, who you might have seen briefly just before, uh, who's hosting this session with me as well for the Q&A session afterwards. Great. Um, can everyone see this full screen? Not yet. Okay. So there's no, we haven't seen anything shared yet. Right, let me uh, reshare here. Okay, this should work. How is that looking on your end, Martin? That is looking perfect at my end. Thank you very much. And it's showing full screen. You don't see my notes. It's showing full screen. It's doing everything it's supposed to do. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you so much for the kind introduction, Martin. It's, it's really a sincere pleasure to join you today uh, for this esteemed uh, BBE 2021 annual summit uh, amidst so many um, fantastic colleagues and, and peers doing incredible work across disciplinary boundaries. So thanks again for your kind invitation. So I'm going to start my talk with a familiar and unfortunately now well-known fact uh, that is, according to the World Green Building Council, uh, building and construction, uh, which is the highlight of this session in terms of uh, looking at living construction, account for 40% of the annual global carbon emissions. The heating, lighting, and cooling of buildings accounts for 28% of this total, and the remaining 12% comes from what is known as embodied emissions or upfront carbon associated with materials, construction and building processes throughout the building's life cycle. The energy intensity per square meter of the global building sector must improve on average by 30% to 
and that's quite a high percentage uh, factor, by 2030 to meet international climate ambitions as set in the Paris Agreement. At the same time, the COVID-19 pandemic is forcing a reconsideration of our workspaces, residences, as well as other occupied structures, such as the studio spaces that many of us uh, find ourselves teaching in, as well as products and supply chains, as these crises reveal systemic issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion that have inspired new models for distributed practice uh, that have emerged in the last year plus and fabrication, fabrication such as Operation PPE, which leveraged the participatory and network space of design and making across disciplines to innovate design solutions to rapidly respond to gaps in supply chains at times of extreme crisis. Ever more pressing are the need for radical new models for design research and collaboration across disciplines. One approach entails the hybridization of labs and studios to fuse innovations across science and design to generate next generation building materials and structures that are adaptive, smart, and resilient. In this talk, I'll describe two topical areas of research and practice featuring projects emanating from my lab at Cornell University within the College of Architecture, Art and Planning as well as my practice, Jenny Saban Studio, based in Ithaca, New York, that integrate together bio-inspired design processes and the dynamics of light and energy to innovate responsive non-standard building skins, bio bricks and tiles, as well as sentient spaces. I want to begin my talk um, by reflecting a bit uh, about the foundation uh, for my collaborative work uh, which um, definitely connects to the book that uh, Martin uh, generously presented at the beginning in his introduction. Looking at the early origins as it was structured th through the Sabin and Jones Lab Studio, which was launched uh, literally 16 years ago, almost to the date uh, at the University of Pennsylvania, which was co-founded by myself, as well as now a longtime collaborator, Dr. Peter Lloyd Jones, who is trained as a cell and molecular biologist. Lab Studio was a hybrid research and design unit situated between the Graduate Department of Architecture at the School of Design at UPenn and the Institute for Medicine and Engineering. Within Lab Studio, and this is a, a photograph taken on actually the first day of a course that Peter and I taught titled Nonlinear Systems Biology and Design uh, that brought together graduate architecture students as well as postdocs and fellows in the biomedical sciences, as well as students across other disciplines, uh, including the history of the sciences and beyond. Within Lab Studio, architects, mathematicians, material scientists, and cell biologists actively collaborated to de develop, analyze, and abstract dynamic systems through the generation and design of new tools. These new approaches for modeling complexity and visualizing large data sets were subsequently applied to both architectural and scientific research. The real and virtual world that Lab Studio occupied has already offered radical new insights into generative and ecological design within architecture and also provided new ways of seeing and measuring how dynamic living systems are formed and operate during development and disease. Overall, the driving mission of Lab Studio was to produce new, mo new modes of thinking, working and creating in design and the sciences through the modeling of dynamic multi-dimensional systems across multiple length scales with experiments in biology, applied ma mathematics, making and, and fabrication, as well as material construction. We also focused on a transdisciplinary design model um, and these are definitions brought to us by Marilyn Stember, as well as Ag Alexander Yenisius, um, uh, with references at the bottom of the page here, where they sort of unpack these different um, terms that we frequently uh, confront, uh, where we see intradisciplinary as working within a single discipline, 
cross-disciplinary, viewing one discipline from the perspective of another, multidisciplinary, uh, people coming together from different disciplines, working together and drawing upon each other's expertise, interdisciplinary, uh, looking at the integration of knowledge and methods from different disciplines and using a real synthesis of approaches. Whereas in the model that we co-generated um, takes up this term transdisciplinary, which we see as problem and knowledge generation through the collaborative design research process where these processes are emergent, transforming and evolving for innovative applications spanning disciplines as well as disciplinary frameworks. This also includes fundamental concepts and methods and design and emerging technologies across the design arts, engineering and science to importantly prepare students with the necessary tools and knowledge for iterative, hybrid and synthetic thinking in design and making across disciplines. We also took up this uh, important tenet that nature is resilient, it is not efficient. Um, and we'll look at a few models that we explored uh, in this context. And these were some of the processes um, that continue um, to inform uh, my collaborative work and research that were very much a part of the foundation uh, for Lab Studio as a generative methodology and approach. Um, the co-investigation of dynamic complex systems, exploring nonlinearity and hierarchical relationships, placing an emphasis on the importance of environmental context and I'll unpack uh, context uh, specifically in a moment. And when I reflect upon the last 16 years of work and specifically uh, what Lab Studio uh, produced, I think the most important application or deliverable that we developed uh, was a truly shared process, a truly collaborative space. Because as we all know, it's easy to drop all of the buzzwords, innovation, cross-disciplinary, et cetera. But when you, we get down to it, it's really hard to collaborate across disciplinary boundaries. We have different structures in place for how we lead our days, how we procure funds, how we publish, how we teach, um, and so on. And so developing that truly collaborative space of trust of shared relationships uh, was something that I think was incredibly important from the very uh, beginning. And that allowed us to filter through and analyze abundant information, making sense of data, looking at data in new ways, which contributed to the development of new methodologies and metrics uh, to move fluidly from the qualitative to the quantitative. And visualization really served as a bridge, as a point of departure uh, where we as designers, as, as architects, could bring our synthetic thinking and design to, to work expansively across a set of complex relationships to make sense of those relationships and form a plan, and also to bring our technical expertise, especially uh, at the time coming forth from uh, emerging technologies and all things digital, uh, to visualize and simulate uh, these large data sets. And this contributed to the development of shared techniques using computation to translate between modes of representation and developing importantly customized digital tools uh, to assist uh, with this process as well as automation. And as uh, is appropriately put by uh, key protagonist Buckminster Fuller, these disciplinary boundaries are constructed. They're constructed by us and it is, it is up to us to generate new models. Um, and this is one of my favorite quotes from Bucky Fuller, where he says, about 1917, I decided that nature did not have separate independently operating departments of physics, chemistry, biology, mathematics, ethics, etc. Nature did not call on department heads meeting when I threw a green apple into the pond with the department heads having to make a decision about how to handle this biological encounter with chemistry's water in the unauthorized use of physics department's waves. Nature probably had only one department and only one coordinate omnirational menstruation system. So as Martin uh, pointed out, uh, we recently published uh, this book, Lab Studio, Design Research Between Architecture and Biology, which really captures um, our methodology or modes of thinking uh, through the lens of a series of case studies, um, research that spans disciplines, 
uh, prototypes, demonstrators uh, that work analogically across disciplinary boundaries and really encompasses this shared uh, space of collaboration that we developed, um, which we think was the first model at the time of a truly collaborative space uh, between a cell and molecular biologist and an architect and our shared students. With strong links to my lab at Cornell AAP, uh, the driving mission behind my practice and research is to create resilient science-driven and transformative spaces with and for diverse communities. And as Achim Menges, um, dear colleague and friend, recently stated in conversation with my students, we need more research and practice and more practice in research. We frequently start with very simple parts and rules uh, encompassing a ge generative design process that through feedback and iteration uh, produces much more complex uh, spatial holes. This interest importantly probes the productive tinkering and misuse of digital fabrication machines uh, frequently found in alternate dis disciplines and industries such as in textiles and the automotive industry. And these processes are, of course, informed by issues of craft and making to produce bio-informed and bio-inspired material systems and software design tools that have the capacity to hopefully facilitate embedded expressions in our built environments. Now, going back to, to Lab Studio um, briefly, a seminal reference uh, for my work is the biological extracellular matrix. It's a dynamic protein network uh, that physically and chemically couples the exterior environment of cells with their interior and vice versa. This matrix environment is a cell derived woven and globular protein network that contacts most cells within the human body. Importantly, as I came to learn um, in the early days of Lab Studio, um, within the Jones Laboratory and specifically Peter Lloyd-Jones, who is trained as, uh, as I mentioned, as cell and molecular biologist with expertise in matrix biology. This environment changes dynamically throughout development and disease. And we were specifically interested in models that show how these alterations feed back to control cell and tissue behavior at the level of code or DNA and beyond in multiple di dimensions, including time. And so this presented to me and my students early on a series of very powerful ecological models, thinking models for us to consider. Where half the secret to life in this paradigm, in this scenario, in this biological model is informed by environmental events within a dynamic context, this extracellular matrix that acts upon code as a series of dynamic and reciprocal feedback loops. So this notion of recipro reciprocity, of looking at how context specifies form, function, structure, morpholo morphological change, and so on, uh, served as a, an important foundation that continues to inform the work. Another very important early collaborator, uh, Dr. Xu Yang, uh, who I continued to collaborate with formally, and I'll touch very briefly upon one seminal project uh, that we worked on together as a team. Uh, she is a material scientist based at Penn, uh, engaged in biomimicry and the true definition of the word. Uh, she looks at the, the leaves of lotus plants, the feet of gecko, uh, to design and engineer entirely new materials that are super hydrophobic uh, and together we focused on structural color as a point of uh, departure. More recently I've been collaborating with Dr. Dan Lau uh, who's in biological and environmental engineering at Cornell and he's doing incredible work uh, with 3D printed hydrogels uh, to work with programmable matter infusing those hydrogels uh, with specific DNA sequences uh, to actuate the materials so that they respond to existing environmental conditions. Uh, and I'll touch upon a couple of projects that we're working on together. So in discerning which effects and materials are actually scalable, uh, my practice and research operates across three phases. 
Uh, the first includes new tools and novel methodologies for modeling behavior. Uh, sometimes this behavior focuses on a biological data sets, other times it's materially driven, sometimes it's driven by a mathematical concept or a specific algorithm. The second entails architectural prototyping at the human scale, so beginning to product productively contaminate the process of making uh, with constraints that come to us across scales, um, oftentimes coming to us uh, from the discipline of architecture itself. And this is where we begin to uh, incorporate various machines uh, and fabrication processes such as 3D printing and robotics. And then finally, uh, some of these successful prototypes are brought into the realm of buildings and the topic of building ecology. So it's a purposefully slow process to work in a rigorous fashion and to meaningfully grapple with the problem of scale. Not all of these models and concepts and constructs are scalable. So one of the fundamental questions that informs uh, both our research as well as practice is how might buildings and their integrated material systems behave and respond more like organisms and adapting to their local contexts. We couple architectural designers with engineers and scientists in a research-based laboratory studio to develop new ways of thinking, seeing, and working in each of our fields. So I'd like to start um, by briefly touching upon uh, an early project. And I'd like to focus on discussing this project, not so much for its sort of technical details um, and the specifics of the project itself, which I've presented many times. Many of you have probably seen me talk about this project. And if you're interested in taking a deep dive into eSkin, I invite you to visit our lab uh, website, um, sabinlab.com, uh, to take a look at uh, some of the published technical papers on the project. But instead, I thought I would focus a little bit more on the collaborative model that uh, this project inspired, and I think uh, was really the, the result and success of. And, and this project engages adaptive materials in this fundamental uh, question that I just posed, as well as the notion of um, taking on personalizing architecture and considering how we might begin to tune our spaces. And so this project is titled eSkin. Uh, it started in 2010. And uh, this uh, was the team, uh, which included, as you can see, uh, Peter Lloyd-Jones, uh, as well as Xu Yang. Uh, so bringing together biologists and material scientists, as well as colleagues uh, from electrical and systems engineering, and of course, important contributors from my team, including Andrew Lucia. So by 2010, uh, we had about a four to five years of collaborative experience uh, as structured through the model of lab studio. Oh, Xu Yang and, and Peter, and myself were co-mentoring and advising thesis students, um, both in architecture as well as in biology and the medical sciences. And according to the program officer that was running this um, call for the National Science Foundation, the lab studio model was actually one of the biggest reasons why we were successful in procuring one of these multi-million dollar grants uh, across the US and there were only 10 that were awarded. Uh, and that was encouraging to us um, because at the time across both of our disciplines, multiple disciplines, uh, we had a, a lot of pushback uh, for the work that we were doing. Um, you know, key colleagues wondering why I was spending all of this time with biologists, why I was attending lab meetings and participating uh, in these, these various processes and, and vice versa. Um, uh, Peter and Shu also getting quite a bit of pushback uh, for working with me and, and the architects. And so it was very encouraging to have an institution like the National Science Foundation uh, put their stamp, so to speak, on the work um, and demonstrate the importance um, of the work and the contribution that we were making, which was really pioneering at the time. And so that really allowed us to, to hit the ground running. And to give a little bit of background into the call, um, the NSF put out a, 
a call for collaborative teams that would include architects uh, that would engage in the problem of sustainability. And they were interested in collaborative teams that would rethink the problem of sustainability and specifically within buildings and specifically high rise buildings, addressing uh, aspects of building heat gain and, and so on. And as I quickly realized um, in participating in the development of this proposal, and um, as many of you may know, going after one of these grants is quite an endeavor uh, in producing the proposal, um, that one does not get NSF funding without prior NSF funding. And so I owe so much to my colleagues in the sciences for showing me the ropes, uh, understanding what it takes uh, to be successful uh, on one of these grants. Uh, and also to align myself with um, colleagues uh, that had previously procured funding from the NSF. And so this was our point of departure, this notion of a dynamic reciprocity, um, where at this stage of the research, uh, we were literally plating um, smooth muscle cells onto these organic polymer substrates uh, being fabricated in the labs of the material scientists. And we were interested in how changes uh, in these engineered and designed substrates, uh, which is a PDMS, an organic polymer. So changes such as compliance, changes in patterning, changes in the fabrication process uh, would in turn impact the behavior of the cell. And so we contributed to visualizations and simulations of this. We helped with the design of these substrates and you can see the cytoskeleton lassoing up and around these pillars and the changes that happen when we move from a gridded matrix uh, to one that has wrinkles. Um, you can see directly um, how those changes are impacting the cells. And so what we proposed to the NSF was not by any means to put human cells on building skins, uh, but to learn from this dynamic design ecology um, and to then extract engineer and design characteristics uh, and principles uh, from that phase of the research uh, into sensors and imagers and thin film technology um, that could locally respond and adapt uh, to a specific context. Uh, and what we specifically proposed was the development of a thin film e-skin, uh, which could be integrated into either existing construction or a new facade design. And just to give you a little bit of detail on some of the things that we focused on, <clears throat> we began to focus on uh, the topic of structural color as a primary uh, area of development. And what you see here is a dynamic switching uh, of color and pattern transformation. And it's an example of a predefined geometric pattern, in this case, holes or pillars uh, embedded within a shape memory polymer uh, material uh, that's displaying structural color change uh, under deformation and recovery. And so as many of you know, structural color change is, is not pigment based. There are many examples and models found in nature, such as the blue morphal butterfly wing. Uh, and so when these materials undergo uh, mechanical transformation, I st slightly stretch the material, these holes and pillars begin to change their orientation and light interacting with that specific wavelength will then in turn um, cause a dynamic switch in color or transparent, a dynamic switch from transparent to opaque. And importantly, we perceive those changes uh, as a part of that dynamic uh, transformation. And so we began to develop a whole series of prototypes harnessing these optical properties for real-time interaction. Um, we had to develop our own rendering software uh, to work with the complexity of the eSkin data. And what one of the prototypes that we were most proud of, this took two years uh, to make um, from scratch, working collaboratively at the lab and studio benchside. The second prototype, uh, which exists at the human scale, aims to advance speculative design trajectories uh, within the eSkin project as, as a physical interactive and scaled component prototype whose properties behave in a comparable manner to those observed at a nano to micro scale, but which can be fabricated at a human scale. 
And so, as I mentioned, not all of these materials are scalable. Uh, we quickly found that the PDMS e-skin material uh, would be incredibly laborious if we were to fabricate a full swath at the scale that you see here, and also incredibly expensive. And so we began to work with another material that exhibited the same characteristics uh, in terms of transformation, dynamic switching from transparent to opaque and color change and so on, which entailed working with nano colloidal particles uh, within a sandwich of ITO glass or, or conductive glass. And again, I invite you to take a look at the technical papers for this project, uh, which were published um, actually now many years ago. And this is, is where our, you know, our vision uh, continues to be in terms of how the e-skin could operate um, at a building scale. More recently in building upon uh, this project um, in designing dynamically with light and energy and specifically working with the topic of structural color as informed by biological processes, We've embarked upon a unique collaboration with the DEFECT lab, uh, which is based at Arizona State University uh, and specifically working with um, my colleague, Mariana Bertoni to innovate uh, the design and engineering of building integrated uh, photovoltaics or BIPVs uh, through computational design and 3D printing. And we're focused on uh, the generation of highly customized uh, non-standard filters and panels uh, that result in site-specific non-mechanical tracking solar collection systems. And the project, which is titled uh, Sustainable Architecture and Aesthetics, Emergent Design for High Performance Solar Panels, uh, is funded by the National Academy of Engineering, as well as the Granger Foundation. We began uh, together uh, with a focus on biological adaptations, uh, including uh, taking a deep dive into the heliotropic mechanisms in sunflowers and the light scattering structures in lithop plants for non-conventional configurations of panels uh, for designing with light and energy uh, to maximize energy conversion efficiency. And as many of you know, um, Integrated building photovoltaics are often an afterthought. Um, they're not considered as an integrated part of an architecture design process. And so we're attempting to rethink that and to design uh, more dynamically with the behavior of light, um, but also to leverage a contemporary fabrication technology such as 3D printing to control orientation and light scattering and, and so on. And so our proposed approach overall um, follows solar path data and omits the typical 50% additional structural metal and 30% copper cable uh, per module, which significantly decrease, decreases the carbon intensity by 15% uh, for the case of an installation in the Southwest of the United States. We're currently working on a demonstrator uh, prototype pavilion uh, which we've titled Agrovoltaic Pavilion. And this demonstrates what we think is one of the first adaptable systems uh, for BIPVs uh, that features extremely low greenhouse gas emissions and showcasing the potential of sustainable design for a resilient land use model um, and possibly to integrate a, a new approach for the production of food, energy, and water. Related to the multiple years of uh, investigation into the integrated design with light and energy, um, oftentimes biologically informed and with a specific focus on structural color. In my practice, uh, we recently completed uh, Polyform, uh, which was a project uh, commissioned by the College of Human Ecology on Cornell's campus. So this is now a, a permanently installed a pavilion structure uh, that started in 2013 and so was an applied practice project uh, that really followed in parallel the research and allowed me to experiment um, and push scales uh, in, in some interesting ways. And so Polyform engages uh, personalized architecture uh, through design science uh, at the center of human ecology and, and in many ways embraces the mission of the college. Um, it's a permanent public installation of four perforated uh, crystalline 
metal forms framing a high trafficked thoroughfare on the campus um, for Cornell University. Structural color is achieved uh, with a dichroic or wavelength dependent thin film uh, laminated to uh, tempered glass panels. And light reflect reflecting from and refracted onto the film changes color and grows warmer or cooler, more opaque or transparent, and is not based on pigment as we just discussed, uh, but in how the film selectively interacts uh, through interference or reinforcement of certain wavelengths of light uh, at the microscopic uh, scale. A key component is how we also perceive these subtle uh, to dramatic changes of light and color within the material uh, itself. And this uh, just recently opened um, and uh, is now open to the, the public uh, on Cornell's campus. And I would like to share a, a video that we, we just completed um, that Cornell put together and it, it really captures a lot of the ethos and mission uh, for the project. Spring is here and so is polish form. So exciting. <laughs> this project started in 2013, so this is a big moment. We're interested in creating a project that on the one hand would commemorate Kay's amazing contribution in terms of her work and pedagogical models and leadership for the college and, and her students, but also one that would embrace intersections between science, design, and issues of human ecology that would operate across scales. This structure says to the people walking by, here is human ecology, come see what they're doing here. And this is a lively, vibrant place with a rich history. And certainly that encompasses the legacy and history of this college being a part of the land grant side of, of the university. Oh, and here you get the full uh, reflection of life of Anne. Yeah. Coming up West Path is a perfect way to see the structure and be invited into the pavilion and seeing people come up to it. Some go in, some go around. The most important part is seeing people interact with it. And that for me is, is success. You know, the, just the sheer joy and wonder and the inspiration that it plays and just creating a moment of pause in one's day is what we hope for. So. Yes. <laughs> The project has inspired, I think, a number of, of different types of exchanges, which is very exciting. Think, I think we have bigger visions of how a design from across the whole campus can come together. And uh, I think that that's been facilitated by our interactions. And so that's the thing of it always changing. Yeah. It's never the same. No, never. That's it. <laughs> Just like human life. So in building upon um, the work that we've been engaged in with adaptive materials, obviously spanning multiple scales um, from, from the nano to, to the built scale, we also importantly uh, take a deep dive into the possibilities of adaptive structures and form um, in innovating adaptive and responsive materials uh, and specifically looking at non-standard components uh, through the investigation of rapid manufacturing of full-scale 3D printed parts. And just to give you a little bit of, of background uh, as to the foundation for this work, uh, in 2009, uh, within Lab Studio, we received a grant to purchase our first 3D printer. And this uh, was a powder-based printer uh, produced by Z Corp, and at the time also featured the largest build bed on the market. And we were interested in working with the 3D printer, not as a representational tool, uh, but as a way of rapid manufacturing one-to-one -one scale parts. And 
And also importantly, to look at the promise of holding data. And this was in the context of my work with Peter and how in scaling up these uh, parametric models of biological data sets, uh, obviously as, as an analog, as a translation, uh, but closely uh, depicting their um, actual uh, representation in terms of uh, multicellular SNI structures, how holding that data, these 3D printed parts, uh, could contribute to the scientific process, uh, allowing the scientists to project into um, the problem in a new way and, and to ultimately inform the generation of a, a, a hypothesis, for example. And so it was during the production of many of these prototypes um, that I realized that my body of knowledge um, emanating from a prior life uh, as a ceramic uh, artist and sculptor, uh, having uh, fulfilled the degree requirements for a BFA in ceramics, that I, I literally had a body of knowledge that I could bring to it a new context. And so this photograph captures uh, the first successful 3D printed greenware clay parts. So we took out the proprietary media, mixed up our own uh, high fire uh, stoneware dry clay body uh, batch with a little bit of maltodextrin and sugar uh, and actually had a great deal more success than I anticipated, uh, which really opened up a whole new area of, of research on the topic of digital ceramics uh, and really taking on the possibility of uh, generating our, our own material systems um, and productively tinkering and, and mis misusing uh, these fabrication machines uh, towards various research endeavors. And this has led to a series of seminars and option studios on the topic of digital ceramics, uh, representing over a decade of research, uh, innovation, and teaching. And in my lab, we have focused primarily on uh, bricks, um, specifically a multi-year research project uh, titled Polybrick. And this is uh, Polybrick 1.0, where in the, the context of 3D printing, we can work with non-standard components where every single brick is different. And the making of bricks has not changed uh, for many, many, many years. Uh, and this really opens up new possibilities for lightweight, um, innovating new types of connection strategies that may be mortarless, uh, the possibility of bringing 3D printers to a construction site, uh, working with local earth matter, matter and clay matter, uh, and, and really kind of pushing the boundaries for what is possible uh, in terms of building and construction. Polybrick 2.0, which builds upon uh, the learnings of Polybrick 1.0, uh, again, turns to nature uh, for design models and specifically looking at human bone formation as a point of departure. And so natural load bearing structures are characterized uh, by aspects of specialized morphology, uh, lightweight adaptability and a regenerative life, life cycle. And Polybrick 2.0 importantly aims to learn from and apply these characteristics in the pursuit of revitalizing ceramic load bearing structures. Uh, for this, um, within my group uh, and team currently being led uh, by Begum Birrell, uh, one of my um, incredible current MDC students, uh, which is a graduate program in matter design computation that I started about four years ago now. Uh, we're looking at um, algorithmic design processes, uh, which are employed whose physical manifestations are realized uh, through available clay and porcelain additive manufacturing technologies. And as part of this comprehensive workflow, uh, we develop uh, new tools, um, we develop new fabrication methods, and we also importantly prototype uh, performances, which are then evaluated and analyzed uh, with the aim of looking towards scalable applications uh, in architecture. Polybrick 2.0 uh, importantly suggests a complete methodology um, in continuing to really push the boundaries of our primary aim, which is to bridge digital processes with the production and design of non-standard ceramic building blocks uh, in architecture. And this research builds upon over 10 years of work as part of my lab uh, with the ubiquitous goal to push the boundaries of computational design 
and additive manufacturing technologies to really redefine our approach uh, towards architectural construction uh, and specifically looking at load bearing um, non-standard modules. <clears throat> so one of the overarching and driving uh, aims of this, this project is, is really to learn from natural load bearing structures uh, to inform innovative building uh, technologies uh, that are then specifically realized uh, through clay additive, additive manufacturing processes. And the way that we've done this in terms of um, the workflow, we've divided this up into five areas um, where there is importantly continuous feedback uh, between each of these integrated um, phases or approaches. And importantly, we start by exploring um, through now a long time collaboration with Dr. Christopher Hernandez, uh, who is in mechanical engineering at Cornell, who has expertise in the mechanics of bone. And so we're specifically uh, studying uh, cancellous core bone to draw from the expansive structural knowledge uh, that is present within it. We then interpret uh, the acquired bio-integrative knowledge to then streamline algorithmic modeling and meshing processes uh, at local and global scales with an overarching pursuit to heighten the precision and breadth of workflows uh, that pertain to additive, additive manufacturing technologies and specifically working with obviously clay in this case. We then uh, incorporate a comprehensive analysis um, to inform our design uh, decisions and processes, and also to create active feedback uh, for refinement uh, between the algorithmic and fabrication uh, methodologies. So there's a constant feedback between how we're approaching the natural systems uh, that we're exploring, the development of the geometric uh, modeling and modules, and ultimately analyzing that performance. So why are we looking at bone. Um, most importantly, uh, at all levels, bone is highly adaptive uh, to habitual loading. And this is particularly present uh, within the cancellous trabecular core of the bone that we're studying. And this is a anisotropic uh, heterogeneous lattice structure uh, that undergoes adaptive and cyclic uh, processes of regeneration uh, within its life cycle in response to repeated uh, loading uh, scenarios. And so we're really interested in that dynamic feedback um, between the specificity of the lattice structure, uh, but how that then informs a directionality uh, based on uh, the flows of forces between geometry and, and, and matter. And so in this slide uh, here, you can see how the lattice is undergoing a kind of constant um, evolution, which is guided by loading conditions and is, is partially illustrated uh, here through directional adaptation, which we're really uh, interested in, in capturing as, as a way of thinking, as a methodology, and as a way of um, directing our fabrication technologies. So the trabecular struts orient themselves in the direction of compressive load so that the load is carried primarily in the strongest uh, axes of each. And you can see how that's uh, changing in, in each of these uh, examples within the human bone itself. And as we have learned, um, and specifically working with Dr. Christopher Hernandez, um, this evolution is illustrated uh, within the trabecular thickness as uh, described mathematically by what's called Wolf's Law. And according to the Wolf's Law, if the trabecular stress is under a certain threshold, uh, bo bone resorption occurs, uh, which then thins uh, the trabecular strut. And if it's above a certain threshold, uh, bone apposition processes occur, which then lead to a dynamic thickening uh, of that strut. So these adaptations establish uh, the thickness parameter or dynamic thickening that we're really attempting to capture of the tra trabecular lattice as a dynamic function of its specific loading conditions. And so these uh, three aspects make up for our integrated uh, workflow. Um, we're looking at the morphological quantifi quantifiers of the trabecular lattice. We then synthesize that, interpret that, and then translate these quantifiers uh, to generate an initial lattice uh, structure. And these quantifiers include 
the trabecular number, the trabecular separation, and trabecular connectivity. And in order to translate these parameters uh, to a, um, a meaningful and controllable structure, my team's also been working on um, a, a really comprehensive algorithmic strategy, which is primarily based on uh, sphere and ellipsoidal packing, uh, where there's a direct connection between the packing behavior and the struts um, as defined uh, through a series of connections between the centers of the spheres uh, and the, the tessellated um, mesh structure. So here you can see an animation of the sphere packing uh, where we can see the spheres growing and moving uh, and the lattice uh, changing accordingly. I'm not gonna go into too much detail here, but if you're interested in taking a deep dive, um, again, I invite you to take a look at some of the recent published papers on uh, Polybrick 2.0. But this slide highlights an important uh, phase of the work uh, where we're introducing uh, directionality uh, to control how forces are flowing through what is called a tensor field. And this is defined uh, by a field of three orthogonal tensors at each point, uh, defining the min, uh, mid, and max principal stress directions and magnitudes uh, within the analyzed global design geometry. And within my team, we've been fortunate to work with some incredible students within Dr. Christopher Hernandez's uh, lab uh, coming from engineering who have really focused on the simulation work, uh, specifically working with ANSYS in which you know, a perceived load is applied to an initial global geometry and then we're able to analyze that accordingly. And then lastly, which is also an important part of the process, um, here we're beginning to bring in dynamic thickening, um, which relates back to the Wolf's Law, which I just described, where in this case, we're making a comparison between the tensor field and the lattice. Um, and so this is how the struts are then uniformly uh, or dynamically thickened uh, through the algorithmic uh, process. So as these diagrams uh, highlight uh, the kind of key points uh, within the computational design process uh, and importantly in line with the bone as precedent, we create an adaptive thickening process which gives each strut a unique thickness based on stresses. And this process runs iteratively and in each iteration, we then analyze the max stress uh, of each uh, strut area. Um, and then that informs the dynamic thickening within the lattice. We also engage uh, obviously in performance analysis, um, assessing the non-standard versus the standard. And the results of our simulation importantly show uh, the ellipsoid packing lattices uh, with a higher stiffness per volume ratio um, with 11 out of the 14 standard lattices um, that were uh, compared to each other. So the, the big takeaway here is that building with holes, um, uh, lightweight uh, and so on is incredibly resilient and robust. And of course we see that everywhere in, in nature. So just simply thickening mat uh, material is, is not uh, necessarily uh, the answer. So these results were incredibly exciting, which then informed a whole series of fabrication strategies, uh, beginning with physical prototyping uh, to compare uh, with the simulation models, uh, starting small, uh, specifically working with porcelain, um, incorporating uh, compressive analysis uh, to test print accuracy, uh, and we were in this stage of the process working with the Form Labs uh, printer and Porcelite. Uh, but obviously that presents a scale issue. Um, and so in the last year and a half to two years, uh, we've been innovating uh, custom end effector design uh, for multi-access 3D printing uh, through an industrial robot uh, in my lab where we're importantly embedding information uh, regarding these new print constraints, such as bridging, dynamic thickening, um, changes in the geometry, uh, and so on. And uh, literally this summer, uh, Begum and my team in the lab are printing at full scale um, a series of demonstrator bricks uh, for a hypothetical wall uh, for Polybrick 2.0. And this just gives you a sneak peek 
into some of those successful uh, results uh, that have come forth in the last uh, couple of, of months. I'm just taking a look at the time here. Um, and I just want to touch upon this last project, which I think is, is important, but I know that we want to have some time for, for questions uh, and Q&A. Uh, so Martin, how are we doing on time? Um, we're, we're, we're running a little bit over, but we can also run into the break a little bit for Q&A as well. So, so I'm keen that you share this project with us. So carry on. Okay, great. Sounds good. So in other iterations of Polybrick, uh, we have, and this is Polybrick 3.0, we've been directly working with DNA uh, to achieve living glazes uh, to control specifically uh, fluorescence. And this is in collaboration uh, between my lab and uh, Dan Lau's lab, um, who I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, where we're exploring the potential of designing with light and energy, again, as a primary focus, uh, but in this case, through living programmable matter or DNA steered materials. In an initial project, um, and also importantly in collaboration with Lou Labs, we explored uh, dynamic DNA material with emergent locomotion behavior um, powered by artificial metabolism. And this is documented in our, our recent paper uh, in Science Robotics, um, which looks at metabolism as a key process that makes life alive. And this is importantly a combination of anabolism and catabolism, which sustains life by a continuous flux of matter and energy. So in other words, the materials comprising life are synthesized, assembled, dissipated, and decomposed autonomously in a controlled hierarchical manner using biological processes. And so this early project really informed a number of the current trajectories that we're taking uh, with Polybrick uh, 3.0. Um, and so I invite you, just in the interest of time, I'm not going to go in depth into this project, um, but there's some pretty amazing things that we've been able to uh, develop uh, collaboratively in the context of a synthetic metabolism uh, and the, the possibility of the construction of dynamic materials in a, a synthetic uh, fashion. Uh, and so this, this project really harnesses a bottom-up uh, construction of dynamic biomaterials uh, powered by artificial metabolism, uh, representing a combination of irreversible biosynthesis and dissipative assembly processes. Uh, and we, we focus primarily on the guided design of these uh, pattern structures and importantly, the computational simulations um, bringing in CFD analysis uh, to understand how these matrices were behaving and comparing those to the actual experiments. So building upon this work um, and the expertise in programmable matter, biomaterials and DNA steered nanomaterials, and of course um, our 11 years plus of design research on 3D printed non-standard clay components Polybrick 3.0 explores programmable biofunctionalities um, in constructed architectural environments uh, through the development of advanced ceramic biotiles. And specifically, um, what we're looking at is the integration of and potential of programmable uh, biofunctionalities uh, through the development um, of a one-to-one -one scale 3D printed ceramic tile. And so we're working at scale here, which is really, really exciting. Uh, working with uh, micro scale textured uh, geometries uh, through printed uh, porcelain in this case. And these tiles utilize novel patterning techniques and hydrogel biomaterials to tune surface conditions at both the micro and the macro scale. And so what we're specifically doing is plating hydrogels uh, infused with a specific DNA sequence that in the first phase, we're just controlling um, the emittance of, of light or, flu or fluorescence uh, within the biotile itself. <clears throat> so within this phase of the research, uh, of course, we're using DNA to design with light uh, so that unique signatures fluoresce uh, in the polybrick clay body. So imagine if the walls in your immediate surroundings um, glowed to alert you to contaminants in the air and the second phase will focus on adaptations to the local environment, including proteins, 
that these DNA sequences can uh, respond to and ultimately potentially particulate matter with the aim of cleaning the surrounding air and reducing uh, pollution uh, overall. So ultimately we're exploring the possibility of DNA nanotechnology <clears throat> for creating nano to macro scale materials and architectural elements uh, that can dynamically react to environmental cues and interact with biochemical reactions. And then just briefly related to this, um, we've learned a great deal on the possibilities of the micro, micro texturing. And so here we're looking again at uh, other natural systems, specifically uh, super hydrophobic surfaces, uh, such as the uh, skins of pitcher plants and lotus leaves and so on, uh, to develop tiles that can direct the flow of water. And so in this tile, again, we're working at scale, um, shifting to a vertical orientation uh, where the droplets are being held uh, in those dimples. Another detail of uh, some of those successful uh, results. So imagine a tiled wall where you could uh, direct the water for a green wall uh, or uh, passive cooling within uh, a screen system or um, a multi-layered layered facade system. So in the interest of time, I'm going to conclude um, just with a video, but I'll, I'll play it in the background and then we can, um, if we have time, open it up for, uh, for questions. Uh, but I, I had one more project I wanted to show, but I'm, I'm going to end it here. And um, I've given you a kind of summary of our work. I described the foundation for the thinking kind of ethos of our, our mi mission. Uh, and I, I really invite you to either visit jennysaban.com for the, the work emanating from my practice or uh, sabinlab.com uh, to take a look at uh, what we're doing uh, ongoing in the lab and the published papers that we've developed over the last uh, 15 years plus. Um, but thanks so much for your attention and for joining us this morning and importantly for uh, the invitation to join you this uh, today for this important summit. So many thanks, Jenny. So yeah, I, I think that would be great if we 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 keep that running in the background. What I I, I suspect we do, we, we've got about a fifteen minute break here. But if if you're okay with that, we could at least use ten minutes of that to have a, a few questions. Um, we've got some things coming up through the YouTube chat that might also uh, will get fed through to us, and we might also use. But it would be great if you could. I uh, will share with a link for the YouTube chat so you can go and maybe give some direct answers to some of that stuff as well over the next session. If you're able to stick around, that would be fantastic. Absolutely. Uh, um, a fantastic presentation and uh, so much to get into. Um, I've asked uh, Jane Scott to join us, not Josh, as I previously advertised. Josh will be in the final session. Apologies, Josh. Apologies, Jane. Um, uh, but maybe, Jane, you could get kick off with some some kind of general thoughts or, or questions for, for Jenny. Oh, hi. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jenny. That was um, fabulous. Um, really inspiring um, presentation. Um, I think kind of after watching the whole presentation, what um, emerges straight away to me is kind of the diversity in the projects that you're presenting and the diversity both in terms of fabrication and in terms of materials and inspiration. And I really wondered um, if you could talk about kind of how the trans, how the kind of general principles, how the design principles emerge that become transferable across these projects, or whether each um, kind of each area has its own set of um, its own set of rules and techniques, and that that are less transferable across. Yeah, thank you, Jane. Really great question. Um, I mean, I, there are there are some themes and concepts that obviously translate across the project. So our ongoing focus on designing dynamically with light and energy, uh, how that informs you know, the dynamic switching of, of color, but also moving from transparent to opaque and how we can then leverage that work towards specific applications that touch upon issues of sustainability, for example. And, you know, my expertise is not within environmental systems or sustainability, but we end up touching those important topics um, through the way that we work, uh, which is materially driven, uh, working across disciplines, uh, generative. Uh, so, 
you know, oftentimes we, we start with a question or we, we start with, um, you know, a, a specific model that we want to explore. Uh, and, and that generative approach of working systemically within a set of complex relationships has actually served as an important bridge uh, for me in, in working with biologists and working with material scientists and, and really coming together in, in ways of thinking um, that is systems-based. Um, and, and that has been quite useful in, in forming bridges across the different projects. So there are projects that, that have, let me just remember this real quick, you know, their own specific uh, rules and techniques that we need to follow um, that may be guided by a specific material system. So all of the, the work with digital ceramics uh, has been focused and refined through one particular media, obviously working with, with clay. Um, whereas with the East End project, you know, we're working with organic polymers and, and moving across scales and realizing that certain, certain aspects are not scalable. But there's also, you know, there are themes that run across uh, such as the linkages between what we're doing with the DNA steered glaze and the interest in programmable material systems that can fluoresce and emit light and detect changes in the environment. Uh, and that focus on, on, on light and energy and color change is also very much present within Eastern. And so I'd say the kind of driving uh, focus for all of these different projects is looking at the promise of how reciprocity or how, you know, and specifically how contests can inform change and transformation uh, within materials and, and how we as humans perceive those, those changes is something that is present within all of the projects, whether they're fun, you know, driven by fundamental research in my lab or taking on other constraints uh, such as client needs and site constraints program, et cetera, um, is with the, the practice projects, which I didn't, as you know, focus on so much in this, in this talk. Thanks, Jenny. And so in the last uh, couple of minutes, I, we've got some, we've got very, uh, quite a few questions coming through, but there might be, some of them might be worth visiting in the chat, actually, specifics to do with the, the bio, uh, the, uh, the polytiles uh, project specifically and the, the biological and chemical basis of those. But I wonder whether just in, in reflection, you, you might, uh, Perhaps uh, unwrap a little bit your thoughts on thinking models or the idea you, you, you intimated this idea early in your presentation of the thinking models that, that allow you to bridge between biology and chemistry and physics and, 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 and design, and whether you think that there are fundamental thinking models and perhaps what the difference is between a thinking model and a metaphor, for example, whether you think that there is a there are particular thinking models that you use repeatedly, even though the projects that you work on are fairly diverse. Yeah, I, I think for, well, within my, my group and how we approach a research question, we, we never, we never start with you know, a specific problem or a specific application. And, and that, that's, off, you know, that's often the hardest thing to teach, uh, you know, in, in, in my studios and seminars. And that's frequently also difficult to convey within the research team, especially for, for new research associates, uh, which is a, a letting go of, of needing to know like, what that target is, um, and and that's presented, you know, a, a, a paradigm that has been, I think, really fruitful um, as a way of of thinking, and and that generative model for thinking opens up problems, right? So we focus, as I mentioned early on in the talk, on on problem generation uh, as we work across uh, disciplinary con constraints and. Um, you know, various parameters and, and so on. And as we move forward within a project, 
new constraints come into the fold that begin to steer it towards a specific application or you know a, a specific contribution to to the to the sciences and we i mean the tools that we develop oftentimes are informed you know they're informing directly the scientific process and to be able to operate as a designer as an architect at a radically different scale and to contribute something is is you know equally important to the the architectural potentials of what this work uh, provides and so i think the the model this generative synthetic systems based model for thinking um, has been has been quite fruitful and has allowed us to make impact in you know specific problem areas such as um, sustainability and um, attempting to reduce the carbon footprints of, of buildings uh, but from a perspective that is not based on you know as Rachel Armstrong writes extensively about resource consumption or a kind of technocratic problem solving paradigm which is important uh, but we we need to rethink the way that we're approaching these these problems with new questions and the sciences need design uh, as we all know and and we you know our our ability to think synthetically across a set of questions and complex constraints and relationships um, to work comprehensively to form a plan that mode of thinking is incredibly relevant right now and and so i that's what i tell my students in terms of you know going out into the world and making impact um, but a generative systems based model for thinking across disciplinary boundaries has been um, really fr fruitful for us over the years I, I, so we need another hour <laughs> because Jane and I have got at least a, a, a can, at least half a dozen more themes that we wanted to open up here, but we, we don't have time to do it, I'm afraid. So um, Jenny, I, what I'll do is copy the, the YouTube um, link into the chat. If you're able to stick around for another sort of half an hour or so and answer some of the many questions that have come, come in in the last 10, 15 minutes, um, to the extent that you can in a chat format, um, that would be phenomenal um i'd love to talk a lot more about all of this stuff um but as i say we, we have to move on but thank you so much for a really really inspiring talk and um for joining us today it's been um yeah that's been absolutely uh inspiring and i'm full of ideas and buzzing as i always am when we've we've heard from you jenny so thank you very much well thank you so much martin and jane and, and to everyone for the invitation it's it's great to be here today and you're doing you know some phenomenal work so i look forward to staying in touch Thanks.